come on up here, Quentin. You can help me with some announcements. Happy Sabbath, everybody. How are you doing? I uh, always say that uh, Sabbath comes just in time for me. How about you? All right. Well, welcome again. Uh, any visitors that are here, I'm not going to ask you to stand up uh, and call you out, but you're most welcome. Um, today, uh, Quentin and I are responsible for giving some announcements. Um, first announcement is there is a prayer gathering uh, coming up on July 15th. Um, please, uh, you're more than welcome to attend. And then there's several announcements in the bulletin. First, I'd like to call out is... Welcome back to Bob Bradley. The young man is here. Yes, thank you. Uh, happy birthday to Dan Howard. Uh, he's turning 44 today. And uh, Mrs. Howard is one lucky lady. Uh, we got lots going on. Next week is communion. Um, so plan for that. Uh, there's going to be a fellowship potluck as well. Um, July 4th, there's a party. Wait a second. There's a party to celebrate the July 4th. That's at our house. Indeed it is, yeah. Oh. Okay, well, I guess there's a party at our house. Good to know. Uh, looks like it's for the youth of the church, so all youth are more than welcome to come to the party. Um, one thing I want to call out is stepping stones. You're looking for some place to send your uh, little one. Feel free to uh, enroll at Stepping Stones. Um, looks like Wednesday, uh, the men's and women's Bible study will not be meeting on July 5th or July 12th, uh, but they're going to resume on July 19th, which is your birthday. Very special day indeed. Yeah. So talking about birthdays. We've got a whole ton of birthdays to get to. What? What's going on? What? What is going on? are that are going to be here? The ages, it's going to start, you know, the younger kids, and it goes up to sixth grade. Okay. Jackie? All right. What do you think it is? Four years old? Eight. 
Eighth grade. Four eighth years grade. to eighth grade. All right. Eighth grade, so. Wow. Okay, well, um, we're super excited about it. It starts Sunday night, yep. and it goes until Friday. Yep, Friday's So a week, a week from tomorrow. For sure. So All right. don't miss it. Very good. Well, thank you very much. But nice to meet. Can I, wait a minute. Can I pet the shark? Yeah, she, you know, she's okay with it. Okay. Oh. Okay. That's nice. Wow. All the kids can pet a shark next week. Okay, thank you very much. We're so used to have here with us uh, Bob Bradley to lead us in songs. So I was just wondering if, uh, if Bob was going to step up and uh, lead us in songs. And by the way, guys, the performance of uh, our VBS people is amazing. We're expecting more than 60 children coming for VBS. If you still have children or grandchildren or nephews or nieces that need to be here, please sign them up. It's going to be exciting. So again, let's give us a hand of applause to our team of VBS uh, teachers. And also to Bob Bradley, who had a surgery, what, what was it, two weeks ago? 14th. Oh, the 14th, okay. So, and he's already here with us to lead us because without you, Bob, we, we suck. Okay, so please come, come here and lead us in our opening song, and then we're going to continue with it. It was nice to be back. I got me a little walk down with my cane here, as you can see. And people see that, they give you money. <laughs> Listen, I want to thank everybody. I felt your prayers, uh, the phone calls, uh, the cards, everything that went on. And, you know, as many people as I put to sleep for surgery, Lord have mercy, I didn't know that it went this way <laughs> when you're on the other side of the fence. Boy, it's a change. So I think one of the best things that happened to me that the guy that gave my anesthesia was one of the guys that I used to work with in a group, and he saw my name on the schedule and said, I'm staying here to take care of Bob. And he put a nice block in that lasted for two days. But oh Lord, when that block wore off. <laughs> but at any rate, it's nice to be back. I'm still sore and you go to rehab, you're feeling good, but you come out, they hurt you. And they say it's supposed to get you better. But at any rate, praise the Lord, I'm back with you. Much. Thoroughly missed you. Blessed Jesus at thy word, hymn 60. Everyone with me. Otherwise, I'll take another month off and we'll see what goes on, okay? <laughs> Not really, but sing with me, okay? Oh, second seven. All our knowledge, servants, I life in deepest darkness shrouded till thy spirit breaks our
Friends, I would like to introduce uh, uh, the next uh, person who is going to join me here. Uh, it's Elder George Babcock. He's going to have our prayer and offer. Elder Babcock, besides being a, a missionary uh, in the, um, Pakistan, if I'm not mistaken, he has also been uh, educational secretary for the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, and we are so proud to have him as uh, part of our congregation. So Elder Babcock, please uh, lead us uh, in the prayer and the call for Thank you, Pastor, and good morning to this wonderful church family. I'm very happy to see each of you. Now, before we have our prayer, I'm wondering how many of you have some special request. In your own life or a job or school or something. Let me see your hands. Oh. I'm surprised. I see people who have no problems at all. <laughs> well, that's good. Going on in your life. Now, as far as possible, uh, let us kneel before the Lord. If, you know, if you can. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, and our dearest Savior and friend, Jesus Christ, and the fantastic Holy Spirit, wonderful it is to come into your presence in your special house on this Holy Sabbath day. And it is a huge blessing for us as a congregation to be able to call you our Heavenly Father. It's an even larger and more precious blessing for us as individuals to be able to call you Father and to realize that you, Jesus, would have come and died for even one of us. Now, I, for one, Lord, have a hard time getting my mind wrapped around this concept, but oh my Father, how thankful I am that you did exactly that. Therefore, please and teach us to be truly thankful for all that you have done for us. Now this Sabbath, we think of all of our loved ones who are not worshiping with us, those we dearly love and long to be in heaven with us. We all have family members who are not following you as they should, so please call after them and send your Holy Spirit to work on each heart and to help each individual to grasp how easy it is to be saved by acknowledging Jesus Christ as his or her personal savior and asking for forgiveness of sin. Our maker and king wants everyone to be saved. And he has called out to each person in this whole world. And the scriptures are full of examples of how Jesus through the Holy Spirit calls after each one. So help each of us to be filled with that same kind of active love that longs for everyone to be saved. Now the birthday of our nation is coming up. And bless our government leaders with the common sense that they desperately need to govern our nation. And today we also pray for every aspect of our church work here in Worthington. We have several ministries And these various ministries may not seem very important to some. Well, if that is true, well, then maybe 
as church members, we have not been feeding on the written word of God as we should. And we know that nothing will draw us closer to Jesus than to read his word every day. Now one project, Father, that is dear to my heart is our church school and stepping stones. So bless each teacher and every student. The children are the future of this church. So make Worthington Adventist Academy and Stepping Stones all that they can be. Now we pray for your Holy Spirit to be in our church and the angels today to help to impress upon our minds the importance of the main spiritual lessons of this divine service. Bless our pastor as he speaks words of truth today. And we pray for forgiveness of sin. We pray for power to stand during the spiritual warfare that is going on all around us. And help us to be prepared for the latter rain that is coming. And we will give you our eternal thanks. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm really glad that Bob Bradley is back with us. <laughs> You know, he gets up here and calls for the offering, and when he does, he always has something very humorous to say. And uh, I was reading that in the early church, you know, the church service was a joyous, happy occasion. And I can imagine that taking the so happy to give. Historical facts. But anyway, folks, we are so glad that uh, Bob is back with us. My last Sabbath, Kennedy Dulo um, talked to us for a few minutes about a special project going on in Kenya. And uh, this is called the, uh, as I recall, the Rafiki project going on. And uh, so, uh, you know, they have a school and an orphanage there. I've been to, I've been to Kenya a number of times, but I never saw this place. Rafiki. I think that's the name of a village also. But, you know, the work is growing like everything over there, and so I'm sure there are more, many more schools and, and orphanages than there used to be. So, um, anyway, Kennedy Dulo was pleading that we uh, think about... And if you would like to give, why, you should mark your tithe envelope, uh, the Kenya Project, and our church secretary will know where to put that money. So you, you can do that. Now, <clears throat> our church expense is also in great need. You've heard this before, week after week, but about this time, in the middle of the year, we seem to get behind in our church expense, and we need to, you know, keep that up. And also, it has to do with our So, we need to be faithful in all of our giving. Now I'd like to have the, the deacons to come forward to collect 
uh, they offer him. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our gracious Lord, again we pause to thank you for your many blessings, far more than we can count. Bless us, Father, as we give back to you, and help us, Lord, to serve you faithfully and from a generous heart. Amen. Friends, before we uh, sing together with uh, 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 Bob Bradley, a very important uh, hymn, I would like uh, to invite here with me uh, Elder Dan Thorward. Yes, Dan Thorward, this Dan, yes. Uh, he does not. First, let me introduce myself. I, I don't think I did it in the beginning. I'm uh, Pastor Julian Filipov, and I'm the lead pastor of Worthington Seventh-day Adventist Church. And next to me is uh, the chair of our school, Worthington Adventist Academy, who for the last, uh, was it three or four years you were chair? A chair for four. for four years. For the last four years, he served as a chair of our school, 
and our school has been grown by leaps and bounds. With God's help, we may uh, be at the number 100 this uh, coming, coming fall. And uh, according to our policy, after three or four years, uh, we change uh, our chair so that other people get the opportunity to lead. But I would like to express my gratitude on behalf of the Warding Conservative Adventist Church for the wonderful job that you've done. And uh, we've been growing uh, from around 30, mid 30s uh, to more than uh, 90. And this is amazing, and thank you so much for your leadership. So, your, your education pays off. <laughs> He's, by the way, uh, studying PhD in leadership. So, thank you very much. And this is a very small token of our appreciation. It by no means uh, pays for all the uh, sleepless uh, uh, evenings and late evenings you have had to spend uh, dealing with school issues. But thank you very much for what you do. Thank you, Pastor. So, thank you. And now, regarding the birthday of our country. You may not uh, guess it by my uh, American accent that is tinted with some Bulgarian import, but I am, the, I'm a, I am a United States citizen together with my wife. Uh, we are proud. <laughs> and we are American by choice. Some of you didn't have the choice and you're just American, I don't know, by birth, but we are American by choice. We are American and we appreciate worship God, we can express our freedom of uh, thinking, of conscience. I and my wife, we were raised in a communist country where it was forbidden to speak about God, it was forbidden to be yourself, it was forbidden to be free. So to all of us who enjoy these freedoms, and sometimes we take them for granted, I just would like to remind all of us that it has costed a lot to many men and women who have paid the ultimate price so that we may enjoy this freedom. Amen. May we guard it, may we cherish it, and may we never get it and take it for granted. With that said, I would like to invite Bob, who is going to lead us in a very patriotic song, and I would like to ask you to stand up on your feet. Let's honor all those who have uh, paid the ultimate price, all those who have served our country, to make it great and to make it free. Would you all stand with me and let's sing it proudly because freedom sometimes isn't free. Everyone with me. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light but so proud Carolyn, and thank you, congregation. May God give us all the accomplishment that this country has done, this country has done for people around the world and for people of all ethnicities, of all skin, skin colors. And I have said it before, and I would like to re-emphasize it again. Probably of all the countries on earth, this is the country that reminds me the most of heaven. Because if you think in heaven we are going to be just black or just white or just Asian or whatever other 
ethnicity you would like to divide yourself in, guess again. The Bible tells us that people of every nation, of every language, and every accent are going to be there celebrating the grace of God. And I'm proud to be part of this country that reminds us so much of heaven. Not everything is perfect. We're not there yet. But with God's grace... more and more of which we are all citizens would you please bow your heads with me in prayer Heavenly Father thank you so much for the United States of America thank you so much for the freedoms we enjoy thank you very much for the men and women who have served this country and made it the country of freedom we enjoy today. Bless our men and women who are still in service. Protect them where they are and give their families the sense that they are serving something much greater than themselves. Thank you, Father, for listening to our prayer. And now that we are about to open your word, speak to our hearts. Let's enjoy the wisdom that streams from your divine word. And let us be reminded of the heavenly values and of our heavenly citizenship that will last forever and ever. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. And all the people said together, Amen. Amen. Friends, you have joined us uh, here for yeah. 10 months. We are studying the book of Genesis. And I've called the book of Genesis the book of origins because it is the book that shows us the origin of life and also the origin of that gives us the reason why many people destroy marriages because sin has entered this world. This is the book that explains why we speak with so many different accents and there are so many different nations around the world. But above all, the book of Genesis is the book of the origin of the most precious gift that God has given humanity. The gift of His bountiful grace. And today as we contemplate this gift that leads us through this world and was, is about to lead us home, I would like to invite our team upstairs to dim the lights and in just a few seconds you're going to see our bumper video that is going to introduce our sermon series. On June 27th, 1976, armed operatives of the, police, the uh, Popular Front of the Liberation of Palestine 
hijacked a French, a French airplane that was taken off from Tel Aviv to Paris. They surprised the 12 flight attendants and the crew and hijacked all the 113 Israeli passengers, passengers on the plane to unannounced location. The plane was struck lately bound toward Central Africa, where he actually landed in Uganda. The president of Uganda back then, Idi Amin, was the patron of this hijacking and gave his country and the airport of uh, uh, Entebbe as a place where the hostages will be held for another seven days. For the next seven days, the hijackers were planning their next step. In, it seemed as if they had all the control of the situation. However, 2,500 miles away, far away in Tel Aviv, 100 Israeli commandos boarded three airplanes, C-130, Kertlis, bound toward the, uh, toward the airport of Entebbe. And during the cover of night, they were planning one of the most daring attacks of the 20th century. They invaded the airspace of Uganda. Two of the airplanes landed on uh, Ugandan soil. And within minutes, the hijackers were killed and of 113 Israeli passenger, passengers, 110 hostages were set free. On July 4th, early morning, the Prime Minister of Israel announced with and joy in his voice that this is an attack and this is a rescue that is going to be forever remembered by both friends and foe. Yet Israelis resolve in battle and their stealth, stealthy operations are much older than that. Today out of the father of all Hebrews, Father Abraham. Because the Bible tells us that long before the nation of Israel existed, Father Abraham carried one of the most successful military operations in human history, with only 318 commandos. He managed to overthrow the coalition of the most powerful kings of the Near East. I've titled my message today, Someone Worth Fighting For. And I would like to invite you to join me and to grab your Bibles and open them to Genesis chapter 14. Today we're going to study the story in which the military heroism and prowess of Abram is revealed. And I would like to tell you that the Bible stories are not given us in order just to entertain us. To, to entertain us. Every one of these Bible stories, as a matter of fact, many of them have more than one spiritual lesson. These are stories with deep moral. And today, I would like to take uh, you on a journey and reveal 
six of the spiritual lessons, the chapter 14, uh, uh, chapter 14 of uh, Genesis is teaching us. I would like to invite someone to read for us Genesis 14, 1 through 3, and then skip to 10 through 12. Thank you, Bill. So Genesis 14, verses 1 through 3, and then 10 through 12. At the time when Amraphel was king of Shinar, Ariok king of Elassar, and Keterlormamor king of Elam, and Tidal king of Goyam, these kings went to war against Bera king of Sodom, and Berish king of Gomorrah, and Sinab king of Amma, and Semaraber. Boy, <laughs> these names are tough. Oh, yeah, that's a complicated one. King of Zeboyim and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. All these latter kings joined forces in the valley of Sidon, that is the Dead Sea Valley. Now, the valley of Sidon was full of tar pits, and when the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some of the men fell into them, and the rest fled to the hills. <laughs> Well, thank you. Well, probably we have to try another microphone. Uh, thank you very much, Bill. These were man f uh, mouthful names, right? Well, just in case, uh, Kedel Omer means servant of the goddess uh, Lomer, which is the goddess of the moon. So these guys were from the... Other people came from Het, which was one of the mightiest armies of the ancient Near East. What's happening here is... I don't know how many of you remember chapter 13. One day a conflict broke out between the herdsmen of Lot and Abram. And when Abram saw what's happening, he made the following proposal to his uh, nephew. He told him, the country is before you. Choose the place where you would like to go. And the Bible tells us that Lot looked at the country, saw the plain of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he liked it. And the Bible says he chose for himself. He chose for himself. And at first, chapter 13 tells us that he moved towards Sodom and he pitched his tent near Sodom, but he did not move into the city. But here in chapter 14, we already see him residing in the city. And I would like to tell you the direction you're moving in life ultimately, you're going to settle at the place that leads you in this direction. And here is something that uh, I would like to emphasize about Lot. Lot chose the best of the country for himself. But he didn't ask God. He didn't ask God if this is the best place to go. He only employed his reasoning employed his business prowess and he thought well my business sense tells me this place is the most fertile people make a lot of money business is thriving there i have to move there and he did till one day he didn't realize when he was moving that these five cities sodom gomorrah adma zevoim and uh, bella these five cities were in a coalition and they decided to rebel against the king of Elam, Kedel Omer. And by that time, Babylonia and uh, Elam made the whole country of Palestine pay tribute 
Udam. One year, Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Savoyim, and Bela decided not to pay this tribute anymore. And unfortunately for our little hero, Lot, he didn't know about that. Because if he knew, he would have been really dumb to move to this place. And the next year, the armies of the East, the NATO of the olden world, came with all power upon the country. We didn't read verses 5, seven, seven, uh, 6 to 7, but the Bible tells us that this, uh, these kings subdued the Anakim and uh, Azuzim, these big guys who were 10, 11 feet tall. They subdued them and reaffirmed the tribute that they're going to pay, and then they came to Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lot was looted. But not only his possession was taken away. The Bible, in a very kind of a laconic language, tells us he was taken captive. Lot was a Babylonian at heart. And he was on his way to Babylon, where he belongs. But not as a tourist. He was going there as a slave. And for those of you who are not familiar with the ancient war of the Middle East, have witnessed the killing of many in Sodom and Gomorrah. His eyes have witnessed the raping of women in Sodom and Gomorrah. And now he is on his way to Babylon, and if at that time he had a daughter or two, they were probably bound to be part of the harem of some Middle Eastern warrior. Lot chose the best part of the country, only to realize that our best without God it's a horrible choice to make. I know that we have in dispute people who are sitting and they are making choices every day. But I would like to ask you, are you making them with God? Do you choose for yourself like Lot did? Are you moving towards Sodom and Gomorrah? What direction of your life are you walking into? And here is the first moral of this, uh, this story. Our smartest choices in life are utter foolishness without the wisdom and the guidance of God. How are you doing? Do you feel smart? Do you lean on your business prowess? Do you lean on your education? Do you lean on uh, your experience to make choices? Our smartest choices are foolishness without God. Now let's continue the story in verses 13 through 16. 13 through 16. Margie? Uh, Kevin is uh, running, racing to, to come to you. So let's hear chapter 14, verses 13 through 16. A man. Is that on? Yes, it is on. A man who had escaped came and reported this to Abram, the Hebrew. Now Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre, the Amorite, a brother of Eshcol and Aner, all of whom were allied with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. During the night, Abram divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions, together with the women and the other people. Thank you, Margie. One of the survivors of Sodom 
escape. And as people were running up the mountains, fleeing from this army, about to kill them or to take them captives, one of them came to the home, to the tent of Abram. And now when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, when Abram heard that, he said, this is what you get for being a smart behind? This is what you get for being so mean to me? This is what you get for disrespecting me, ignoring me, the older guy, and you make your choice without considering me? You deserve it. Enjoy it. Did Abraham say that? But I'm telling you, I know many people who would have said it. Abram won one of the most difficult battles in life. The battle against bitterness. Abram did not because of of his little conniving, scheming nephew. Abram passed the test of bitterness with flying colors. When he got hurt, he did not retaliate. He did not rejoice in the downfall of his little, scheming, conniving nephew. As a matter of fact, Abram considered Lot and his family worthy of fighting for, worthy of risking his own life for this unthankful little selfish person. Even more, he was willing to die for him. In this very moment, Abram was exactly like Jesus Christ who hanging on the cross, being spit upon, being ridiculed by uh, the very people for whom he died. He prayed from the cross, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And here is the second moral of this story. There are people around you worth fighting for. There are people around, around you worth praying for. There are people around you worth even dying for. And let me tell you something that surprised me as well when I studied this passage. Some of these people worth fighting for, worth praying for, and wor worth dying for are actually the very people who have caused some of the most bitter moments in your life. Do you hear that? I don't hear, I don't hear any amens. But this is the very spirit of, of God. This is the very spirit of heaven to not hold grudge against those who behave your, like your enemies but to be willing to fight for them and even die for them. I'm sure in your life worth dying for. Yet Satan comes to us and make us dwell on our bitterness. Make us dwell on our disappointments. Make us dwell on how these people have treated us. And we sit there petting our hurt ego. Well, Jesus is asking us to fight for those who have been hurt. Because oftentimes they're slaves of sins, of addictions. They're slaves 
of their ancestry, of their genes, and sometimes they don't know even any better. And here I'd like to emphasize another spiritual lesson. And it relates to Abraham. Something happened to Abraham in the promised land. Because this simple shepherd, this nobody of human history, from a coward who was willing to sell suddenly becomes a brave man who is willing to fight the mightiest army of the ancient Near East. What happened? How did he become this amazing hero and amazing warrior? And here's the third moral for today. Living within God's plan has power. Living within the boundaries of God's design for you plan is transformational and make us out of cowards, brave men and women who are able to overcome our bitterness, who are able, able to overcome the hurts of the past and to become heroes. But step outside of the boundaries of God's will for your life. And suddenly you become Powerless, nobody. Are you walking within the boundaries of God's will and God's plan for you? And finally, let's come to the last section of this story. Genesis 14, verses 17 through 24. Who would like to read for us verses 17 through 24? I think we are through to most of these difficult names. Thank you, Mary Fran. After Abram returned from defeating Kedor Lamor and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Sheba, that is, the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Sodom, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, With raised hand I have sworn an oath to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread on the, or the strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me to Anur, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them have their share. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mary Fran. Well, let me point out to something here in this story that's really amazing. The book of Genesis, for the most part, starting from, verse, uh, from chapter 11 up to almost uh, chapter 27, is dealing pri primarily with Abraham and with his descendants. The spotlights are on Abraham. Abraham is going to come through whom Messiah is going to come. But suddenly, in the obscurity and depravity, depravity of Canaan, out of there comes a man that is higher in the heavenly hierarchy, higher in the rank of heaven than Abraham himself. And this uh, uh, person is Melchizedek, the king of Shalem, the king of peace.
the most high. The definite article. Abraham was a priest as well. He was building altars and sacrificing animals. But this Melchizedek, higher than Abraham, he was the high priest. Because he blessed Abraham and Abraham gave him a tithe. It is boggling and it's amazing spiritual insight to find among the wicked Canaanites in Abraham's time that right there, there is more important than Abraham. Uh, register that. Abram recognized that God's revelation was not limited to him. Did you get that? Oh, kind of, okay. Abraham re realized that God has special servants in very unlikely places. Oh, amen? Okay, okay. You, uh, okay, wake up. I would like to explain something. I assume the majority of the people here are Seventh-day Adventists. So allow me to speak to the Seventh-day Adventists now. As a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, I do believe that we Seventh-day Adventists have a special message, that we have a special mission to restore some biblical truths that have been neglected in, uh, among most of our Christian brothers in the other denominations. Like the teaching that when Jesus died on the cross, our digestive system didn't change. Surprise, surprise, but some people believe so. And suddenly the pork with the trachinia lavra in the Old Testament did not become healthy because Jesus died on the cross. Also, we have some amazing teachings about the true day of rest. That God never changed the Sabbath because it was created before sin in the paradise. And the book of Isaiah tells us that we're going to enter the Sabbath to celebrate an eternal Sabbath. And that the Sabbath is going to be everlasting. Yet many of our Christian brothers do not know that. And sometimes we as Adventists are tempted to become very smug, very judgmental and condescending and look down upon them and think that we are better than them. The story of Abraham teaches us something very important, friends. At whose feet uh, they are worthy for us to, uh, to kneel down and to ask them to bless us. In some of these places there are people that I'll gladly exchange them to, for some of my members. And if you think that I'm preaching a heresy, you just woke up. Because this is exactly what Abraham believed. He did not believe that he is the only source where the divine revelation stops. He understood that in very unlikely places, the Spirit of God is working. And the Spirit of God is working in a mighty way. And some of these people that we consider they are Babylonians, and live far away from God because they do not understand all these things that we do. Sometimes in spirit, they are much taller than us. And if you still have the tendency to become smug because of the special truths that God has given us, I would like to remind you that those people who crucified our Savior ate kosher and kept the Sabbath. And now, can I have your attention, please? And I told people first service, I'm going to tell it second service, I already messed up, so what do I care? My wife has forbidden me to preach about uh, money and giving. 
So I, I'm going to be in the doghouse uh, tonight, and I'm not going to eat lunch. So I forfeited my lunch already first service. I'm going to tell you what I told you, the people first service. Oh, dinner grocery, okay. I am fasting, guys. But this just tells you how much I love you. I would like you to know what God wants you to know. When Abraham received this victory, and again, I would like to emphasize, it was an amazing victory. He defeated the king of Babylon. He defeated the king of Elam. Defeated the Hittites, which you can read in ancient records. These were the most fierce, uh, fearsome warriors. Undefeated. He defeated all this coalition with 318 people. This feat was outmatched only by Gideon later, who did it with just 300. Abram had 18 more. And when he came from this victory home, he was met by two kings. The king of Sodom and the king of Salem, Melchizedek. How did Abraham recognize, how did he express his gratitude to God for the victory? What did he do? He gave a tithe. And here is something that I would like uh, you to remember. And this is a spiritual lesson deep rooted in this uh, text. Tithing is a recognition that every blessing we have in our lives comes from God. It's not an extortion that churches just try to uh, get from you and make you uncomfortable and all these things. According to the Bible, and you can see this repeated time and again in the pages of the Bible, tithing is a recognition that God is the owner of this world and of my life. Tithe is a recognition that God is the Lord of my life. Tithing is a recognition that my education, my career, my job, my income, my children, everything that I possess is a gift from God. I know that this is a very difficult uh, topic to grasp. I know that this is the most sensitive nerve in the human nervous system, the pocket nerve. You touch it and people jump. You touch it and people hate you, and my wife don't, don't want, does not want me to, to be hated. Why do you think God is so obsessed with possessions and money when he speaks only 500 times about prayer? Because God knows that possessions oftentimes possess us. That he cannot have our hearts unless he have first I think it's a recognition that God is the master of everything that he has bestowed on me. Do you know that God forbids us in the Bible to try him, to test him, to put him uh, at the test? Except on one thing. He tells us, try me in tithing and see if I'm not going to bless you. He says, try me. Try him. And if he does not bless you, you are excused to not give anything to him. I'm going to conclude this uh, rant about uh, this very uncomfortable topic that will make me fast today with one quotation from the founder, one of the founders, we have three founders of the Seventh day Adventist Church. And here is what she says about this topic. As the giver of every blessing, God claims a certain portion of all we possess. Preach it, sister. This is, the, this is his provision to sustain the preaching of the gospel. And by making this return to God, we are to show our appreciation for his gifts. But if we withhold from him that which is his own, how can we claim his blessings? Basically, she says, you're arrogant. You're arrogant to kneel down and ask God for his blessings when you are robbing him, when you are not faithful to what he asked you to do. And then she concludes with this thought. 
It may be that here is the secret of unanswered prayer. Okay. Enough of that. Oh, thank you. I got one. Amen. Amen. Oh, well, let's conclude this with uh, the last point, the last moral of the story. The king of Sodom. Do you know that the, the Bible makes a very interesting contrast between the two kings? The king of Sodom and the king of uh, Salem. The king of Sodom comes to his deliverer, Abraham, empty-handed. He didn't bring anything. The king of Salem came with bread and wine. The king of Sodom came empty-handed. And then, the very first word that comes out of the mouth of the king of Sodom is, Give me. In Hebrew is one word. Give me. Tenly. Give me. I would like to tell you something about the Sodomites and the people of Jerusalem. Sodomites are the people who have very strong flexor muscles. They're good in give me. But those who have outgrown this childish age are like Jesus. They're like God. For God so loved the world that he... For God so loved the world that he... God is a giver. The Sodomites are receivers. He comes to Abraham with this ridiculous proposal. Give me the people and... rule of war the conqueror has all what kind of rotten deal that is and Abraham says forget about it I don't need the blessings of Solomon I will tell nothing Abraham says unlike his little conniving nephew Abraham says, I don't want the blessings of Sodom. I want only the blessings that God is going to give me. I'm not going to connive. I'm not going to scheme. I'm not going to accept the blessings of Sodom. I'm going to receive and accept only the blessings of God. And this is the last moral for today. True believers frame their lives so that for all success, joy, comfort, and prosperity, they depend on God. One motif that runs like a golden thread through the whole story is the development of a servant's heart. Through the whole story, Abram is revealed as a servant of his nephew, of the king of Sodom, of all the people around him. Because Abraham has become like Jesus. In this chapter, Abraham has become like Jesus. What about us, friends? God has put some people in your circle of influence. Some people have embittered your life who are in your circle of influence. And you think these people are not worth saving? These people are not worth praying? These people are not worth dying? Today on behalf of God, I would like to ask you, look around your life. Look for those people who you think they do not deserve your prayers. They do not deserve your fight and sacrifice. Dying. And today, I would like to challenge myself and to challenge you. Let's accept this servant's heart of Jesus. And the world around us is going to be transformed. I would like to ask you to grab uh, from your bulletins this uh, yellow connection card. And please turn it to the back. Check at least one of these action steps that applies to you the most. First, I will not exchange God's blessings for the quick rewards of Sodom, but will patiently wait for the Lord to lead and to bless me.
Second, I want to be like Father Abraham, investing time, money, and talent to advance the kingdom of God. And finally, there are people in my circle of influence worth praying for, worth fighting for, and even worth dying for. And I will do whatever it takes to give them the chance to see Jesus through. May God bless us all. Well, it's our job to seek the lost. Would you stand with me? Let's sing together in 373. This is the one where the man had the solo, and man, don't leave me by myself, please. Okay? Let's all sing it together. Everyone standing. now to whom he is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forevermore Amen <laughs> 